we apologize for interrupting your doom scrolling. Now, for some positive leftist news. Welcome to Positive Leftist News, bringing you stories to remind you that the people united will never be defeated, and together we will win. I'm your host, Mexi, and organizers around the world have been making so much happen this month that I am very excited to get right into it. In a groundbreaking decision, the ICJ issued an advisory opinion that Israel's presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, including the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, is illegal and must end as rapidly as possible. The ICJ concluded that Israel's prolonged occupation, settlement expansion, annexation of territory, and apartheid policies have made its continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory illegal, and it must provide full reparation, restitution, and compensation, including the return of all land and the evacuation of all settlements. The ICJ said that all states are under obligation to cooperate with the UN in bringing an end to the occupation and are not to render any aid or assistance in maintaining the situation. As an advisory opinion, this decision is sadly non-binding. However, as the initial request for an opinion was issued by the UN General Assembly, the question will now return to the body, which will decide how to proceed on the matter. Although the General Assembly does not have the power to expel a UN member state without approval from the UN Security Council, it does have the ability to suspend its rights and privileges, meaning that the state would not be able to participate in the sessions of the General Assembly and other UN bodies. This was notably what happened in 1974 when member states voted to suspend the participation of apartheid South Africa over the objections of the United States and Western allies. The Palestinian Authority was delighted with the court's opinion, with the Palestinian Foreign Minister Riyad Malki calling it a watershed moment for Palestine. It's now up to all of us to continue pressuring our own governments to stop all aid and weapons shipments to Israel and keep organizing and fighting for a free, free Palestine. A recent poll by public relations firm Edelman reveals that over one in three people worldwide are boycotting brands perceived to support Israel. The survey, which included 15,000 consumers across 15 countries, shows that consumer activism is particularly strong in countries with significant Muslim populations, such as Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Indonesia. In Saudi Arabia, 71% of respondents reported boycotting brands, the highest rate among the surveyed nations. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which aims to pressure Israel over its treatment of Palestinians, has also gained considerable momentum globally. This has led to significant economic repercussions for Western brands. For example, the Al Shaya Group, managing Starbucks in the Middle East, laid off over 2,000 employees in response to the boycotts. Similarly, McDonald's faced backlash after its Israel franchise offered free meals to Israeli soldiers, resulting in reduced sales in Muslim-majority countries. This shift is driven by strong pro-Palestinian sentiments and a desire to support local economies. The BDS movement is also being felt in Israel's economy as evidenced by significant financial withdrawals from the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Since October 7th, over 34 billion shekels have been pulled from the stock market, including 8 billion shekels from equities, 14 billion from government bonds, 6 billion from short-term loans, and 5 billion from corporate bonds. This financial instability highlights systemic vulnerabilities in Israel's economy. Some corporations have aligned with the BDS movement, facing backlash and legal threats. Historically, it was a combination of political, social, militant, and economic pressure that brought apartheid to its knees. The downward trend in Israel's economy, combined with the level of sustained activism worldwide, is thus a very good sign for Palestinian liberation. Over a hundred activists, including members of the Workers' World Party Boston, gathered in Harvard Square on June 29th to protest against Elbit Systems. Organized by the Palestinian Youth Movement and BDS Boston, the demonstration aimed to shut down the Israeli-owned arms maker, which supplies weapons and surveillance technology used by Israeli forces in Palestine. The protests have had significant financial impacts. Elbit's stock has fallen by over 30%, and major shareholders like J.P. Morgan Chase and Scotiabank have significantly reduced their investments. J.P. Morgan Chase decreased its holdings by 70%, while Scotiabank halved its stake. 
Speakers at the rally highlighted that Elba provides nearly 90% of the Israeli army's ordnance and also supplies surveillance towers used by the U.S. at the Mexico border. They emphasized the importance of taking direct action against such companies in the U.S., calling the campaign a crucial part of supporting Palestinian resistance and opposing imperialism and settler colonialism. One organizer stressed that the campaign is not about rescuing Palestine, but supporting the Palestinian struggle for self-liberation, stating the Palestinian people are freeing themselves, and more than that, they are making revolution irresistible. Following the rally, protesters marched through Cambridge to the home of Peter Palangin, CEO of Intercontinental Real Estate Corporation, which hosts Elbit's Cambridge subsidiary. Outside his mansion, demonstrators condemned his complicity in the conflict and demanded Elbit's eviction from his property. The march concluded back at Harvard Square, where organizers pledged ongoing actions to shut down Elbit in solidarity with global movements for Palestinian liberation. On July 11th, dozens of disability justice and pro-Palestine activists gathered outside Somerville City Hall to demand an end to U.S. support for the ongoing genocide in Gaza. The protest, organized by Somerville for Palestine, coincided with the town's disability pride flag raising ceremony. Activists highlighted the severe impact of the occupation and genocide on disabled Palestinians, who suffered disproportionately due to the decimated healthcare infrastructure. One sign poignantly read, The Gaza Strip has the highest rate of child amputees anywhere in the world. Speakers also targeted the Somerville mayor, demanding she denounce the violence against Palestinians and support divestment from companies arming the Israeli regime. Brian Shea, a longtime disability rights activist, invoked Engel's concept of social murder to describe how capitalist systems devalue the lives of disabled individuals. Ed Childs, a union organizer and Workers' World Party member, emphasized the intersection of disability justice and anti-war activism. The money they're taking from disabled people is used to disable people. The disability movement here is no different from the fight for disability justice in Palestine and all other regions devastated by U.S. imperialism. We have the same enemy. The rally ended with a strong call to action. Achieving disability justice requires ending violence and imperialist oppression worldwide. In South Korea, thousands of Samsung electronics workers have pledged to continue their strike indefinitely, marking an unprecedented labor action at one of the world's largest smartphone and AI chip manufacturers. The National Samsung Electronics Union, representing about 30,000 staff, or a quarter of the company's employees in South Korea, announced the extension of the strike after management failed to engage in talks. The union is demanding a 3.5% increase in base salary and an additional day off to commemorate the union's founding. Management had previously offered a 3% raise, but the union insists on the extra 0.5% to account for inflation. Despite the lack of communication from management, around 6,500 workers participated in the strike this week. The union is also holding training sections to encourage more employees to join, aiming to disrupt production and pressure management into meeting their demands. The union claims that the strike has already slowed production on certain ship lines. The ongoing strike at Samsung Electronics highlights a significant shift in labor relations at the tech giant and reflects wider global trends in worker activism and unionization. PLM will be watching this struggle as it unfolds. On June 28th, protesters gathered outside the Kenyan consulate at UN Plaza in New York City to denounce Kenya's involvement in the occupation of Haiti. Demonstrators chanted slogans such as Genocide in Haiti, Made in the USA, Genocide in Gaza, Made in the USA, and called for the resignation of Kenyan President William Ruto. The rally was organized by several groups, including Friends of Swazi Freedom, Black Alliance for Peace, Bronx Anti-War Coalition, Workers' World Party, and Kamakota. The protesters condemn Kenya's military actions in Haiti, alleging that the Kenyan government is acting as a proxy for U.S. and Western interests in the Caribbean nation. The demonstration expressed solidarity with both the Kenyan protesters fighting against their government's repressive actions and the Haitian masses opposing the military occupation. After 18 days on strike against Ontario Premier Doug Ford's plans to privatize liquor sales and rob Ontarians of billions in public revenue, unionized Liquor Control Board of Ontario workers reached a deal with their employer. The deal is a significant victory for workers who walked off the job to protect their futures and the future of public services in Ontario. It boosts wages, converts casual positions to permanent ones, and protects against store closures for the next three years. This was only possible due to strong public support. 
While Ford's plans to expand privatized liquor sales in Ontario may not be over, this strike is a powerful reminder of what is possible when people take a stand with workers, not just for better conditions in the workplace, but to resist the neoliberal dismantling of the public services we all deserve. Congratulations to the organizers. Kerala, India's communist-led state, has been lauded for its innovative digital education initiative, the Little Kites Program, which has been described as a global model for digital literacy by a recent UNICEF study. Launched in 2018 by the Kerala Infrastructure and Technology in Education, the Little Kites program aims to equip students with essential digital skills and foster a new generation capable of navigating the future's technological landscape. The program serves grades 8 through 10 in over 2,000 public and government-aided schools, impacting nearly 1.2 million students since its inception. UNICEF's study presented on July 6th highlights the program's success in advancing digital literacy and promoting a sense of community among students. It emphasizes skills in AI, robotics, app development, and multimedia, along with critical thinking, creativity, and problem solving. During the pandemic, it played a crucial role in ensuring educational continuity by providing digital access to students when physical schools were closed. The initiative has significantly increased digital learning access compared to other Indian states. Kerala's commitment to public education and digital literacy has garnered international recognition. In 2022, the program received the Best Innovation Project Award from the Kerala government and later that year has even collaborated with Finland's education department to implement the Little Kites model in Finnish schools. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been released from the UK's Belmarsh prison following a plea deal with US authorities. Assange, who agreed to plead guilty to a single charge of conspiracy to disclose classified documents, is set to return to Australia after spending 1,901 days in detention. The release, while celebrated by many as a significant victory for freedom, is viewed through a pan-abolitionist lens as part of a broader struggle for justice. Julia Wright argues that Assange's freedom gains full significance only when it is connected to the fight for the release of other political prisoners detained by the U.S. and its allies. Wright emphasizes that Assange's release should not overshadow the plight of other political prisoners like Leonard Peltier, Kamau Siddiqui, Rashid Johnson, Jamil Al-Amin, and Mumia Abu-Jamal. The call is for renewed focus and action to achieve justice for all political detainees. Hundreds of activists converged in Washington, D.C. on July 6th and 7th to protest the NATO summit, which took place in the U.S. Capitol from July 9th to 11th. The demonstrations, organized by the Resist NATO Coalition, featured a People's Summit, rallies, and a march, and were backed by over 60 anti-war and human rights organizations. Protesters voiced strong opposition to NATO's expansion and increasing militarization. Key speakers, including Ali Husseini of the Palestinian Youth Movement and Anden Bonifacio of Bayan USA, condemned NATO as a tool of modern imperialism. Husseini criticized NATO's role in suppressing liberation movements, while Bonifacio highlighted how U.S. military strategies threaten national sovereignty in countries like the Philippines. The Resist NATO coalition also addressed broader issues, such as the implications of the Secure DC bill and U.S. military strategies in Korea. The coalition stressed the importance of international solidarity and the need for ongoing resistance against imperialism. France's parliament faces a potential gridlock following a surprising surge by the left-wing New Popular Front alliance in the recent elections. The second round of voting on July 6th and 7th resulted in a hung parliament, with no party or bloc securing an absolute majority. The NFP, led by Jean-Luc Mélenchon's La France Insoumise party, emerged as the largest bloc with approximately 178 seats, a significant increase from the 2022 elections. This unexpected gain was fueled by the highest voter turnout since 1981, which propelled the NFP past early front-runner national rally into place. French President Emmanuel Macron's centrist Ensemble coalition won about 150 seats, a substantial drop from his 2022 count. Macron, whose approval rating has sharply declined, will continue as president until 2027, but now faces a challenging political landscape. The fascist National Rally Party, led by Marine Le Pen, secured around 142 seats, marking its best performance ever but falling short of a majority. The new parliamentary dynamics signal a potential shift in French politics towards greater support for left-wing policies and politics more generally. Over a thousand bankers at Citigroup's global headquarters in New York City were blocked from entering work in late June as climate activists blockaded all entrances to the building. 
The protest, which lasted for an hour, was organized by environmental and pro-Palestine groups as part of the Summer of Heat on Wall Street campaign. The demonstrators used sections of a model pipeline inscribed with Citibank Stop Funding Death to block access, targeting Citigroup due to its status as the largest financier of fossil fuel expansion, according to the Rainforest Action Network. The campaign also criticized Citi for its financial ties to Israel amid ongoing violence in Gaza. Activists have highlighted Citigroup's role in financing both environmental degradation and military conflicts. They argue that the bank's financial support contributes to climate change and global conflicts, drawing parallels between environmental harm and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The ongoing protests aim to pressure Citi to divest from fossil fuels and end its operations in Israel. The Summer of Heat campaign, organized by various climate and environmental groups, plans to continue its actions throughout the summer, with upcoming demonstrations targeting other financial institutions and highlighting environmental and social justice issues. We reported last month that ECAN, the European Cruise Activist Network, organized the first International Anti-Cruise Day. This month, several groups in several countries kept up the momentum and organized further actions against the cruise industry on Saturday, July 6th. In Germany, the group Smash Cruise Shit blocked two cruise ships in the harbor of Kiel. Fourteen activists in kayaks surrounded two vessels and delayed their departure for several hours. They also placed banners on the ship's hull, one reading, Make Cruise Ships History. Other banners were also hung from a bridge and the onshore power facility in the port area. The latter was meant to draw attention to the fact that onshore power does not substantially reduce the outsized emissions of a cruise ship and is a form of greenwashing. In France, the groups Stop Croissiers Marseille and Extinction Rebellion Concarneau disrupted the voyage of the cruise ship Seven Seas Voyager in Concarneau. The vessel was anchored outside the port for a stopover and tourists were supposed to be able to have a shore leave with smaller shuttle boats, but 18 activists in kayaks managed to block the entrance of these shuttle boats into the port, cancelling the cruise ship's stopover. There were also massive protests against mass tourism across Spain this month in cities including Madrid, Barcelona, and Mallorca. On the same day as the anti-cruise actions, thousands of protesters joined a demonstration in Barcelona decrying the social, economic, and environmental impacts of mass tourism in the country. The cruise industry is connected to over-tourism in Spain and elsewhere as these vessels bring thousands of tourists into a port at a time. Large vessels often transport 5,000 travelers or more, and new ships are being built even bigger, escalating the impacts on local people and environments. Solidarity with ECAN and demonstrators in Spain who have been bringing much-needed attention to these issues and putting up major challenges to the industry. If you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to mexi at protonmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Catherine, Marshall, and me for script writing, production, and hosting. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. If you'd like to support the show, please go to patreon.com slash positive leftist news, or you can give us a one-time tip via PayPal. The link is in the description box below.